So, um, I'm Kelly Bellick. I'm an associate dean of students in the social sciences. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about sort of where this event comes from, why we're having these kind of events, um, and then our, our speakers can introduce themselves as well. Um, so, we have a new initiative in the division, new this year, uh, the Emerging Leaders Initiative. And this comes out of an idea that our dean, Mario Small, has that we, we really want to prepare our students for a whole range of careers and prepare them for a whole range of careers as they are now. So not just do we want students to go into academia and academia as it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but really where things are now. And so one of the important things we want to do is talk about the skills that students uh, are able to get in grad school and what all you can do with those skills. I mean, and skills that you didn't know you had yet that you can start to develop, um, or maybe skills that you already have and didn't realize it. And, and what all you can end up doing with those. Um, and so this particular program uh, this, that we're calling Research in Action uh, really stems from something that I noticed. I work with students every year who are applying for National Science Foundation fellowships. And one of the things they look for in NSF fellowships is something that they call broader impacts. So why is your research important? What impact is it going to have on the it, that's part of what broader impacts is about. And a lot of students really struggle with this. This is something that they haven't thought about. They just thought, this is research I'm interested in doing, but they haven't thought at all about, some huh, our research would actually make a difference in the world. And so this is something we wanted to start opening up the conversation about in the division. Um, and we have a lot of faculty in the division, we have a lot of alum, both in academia and not in academia, who are doing research uh, that really matters and are talking to people about how it matters and helping you shape policy and, um, and doing a lot of really exciting things. So this is sort of a way to start opening up that conversation a little bit. So first work was on HIV and AIDS in black communities. Um, and then I kind of really turned my attention to young people and their engagement in politics, in particular uh, young people from communities of color. So started an organization and a project called the Black Youth Project. And we're now doing work with uh, Chicago Public Schools. We've held a research seminar, a research institute in the summers for high school students. So um, lots, of, lots of really great work, both in and outside the academy. Great. So um, I thought maybe one of the things we could talk about, and you can talk maybe both about your own research, but also you know, other people you know who are doing research, you know, what sort of audiences are there outside of just academia? I mean, we all know, you know, if you study political science, you can go to political science conferences and talk to other political scientists about what you do. But what sort of other audiences are there uh, for your work, for other work that you've known, um, just in general? But we never know how to do that. I'll, I'll start and then... Whoever wants to talk. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem fair if I always go first. I know, I know. It's a burden. Or if, anyway, um, so I'll go first this time. Uh, it, it's a weird thing for me about kind of the question of audience. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the right question. But the way I think of my work is less about kind of who's the audience, but kind of who are the constituencies that I can work in partnership with beyond mm -hmm. uh, the academy. So when I'm starting a project, I try to think about kind of if I want this to have some impact beyond, again, um, the University of Chicago or my colleagues in political science, who are kind of the key constituencies and who are those stakeholders that I would want to engage in or engage with. Um, but I mean, people know that, for example, if you think about community-based organizations, they are always, at least in my experiences, trying to kind of figure out how to document the impact of their work. Oftentimes, they have incredible organizing skills, but they may not be able to do evaluations or they may not be able to kind of think about how to collect data. So there are always possibilities for working um, with different constituencies where there's kind of truly a partnership, which I think is a little different than some of the um, research that happens in the academy where you kind of go and you study a community, you write a book, and maybe you come back and you do a reading in that community, and that's the end of the relationship. It's not a partnership. Um, but there are also policy makers that you can be talking to and engaging with community-based organizations, organizers. Um, you know, there, as, as far as you can see, there are constituencies that can be interested in the work that you do. I think it's just about 
you know, how do you approach those uh, relationships? And do you, for me, it's always a kind of about approaching them early in the process mm -hmm. uh, versus kind of late in the process when you've kind of done your work and now you're trying to fit it into what they might need. I guess the one thing I would add to that, uh, which, which I totally agree, is you know really understanding um, more more of you know what you're trying to get out of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think is really important. So uh, whether you're you know part of my research looks at local politics and there are, I've talked to different people that uh, are running local elections and say that hey there's lo low turnout in these these things. How do, can I improve turnout? And there's a you know a balanced relationship between you know, how you're going to contribute to whatever this causes. Do you agree with that? Are you comfortable with that kind of information you're getting out of it? But also kind of the broader implications so that it's not just, hey, this is innovative and cool and sounds fun, but, you know, first and foremost for me is making sure that I put out quality, uh, rigorous academic work and get out of here on time. So, uh, you know, never losing yes. sight of your own goals I think is really important as well, but, you know, Educators are, are, are interested in this work, and I would just echo the sentiment of, you know, starting that relationship early. Uh, I think is really important so that you get a sense of what you're going to do and what you're trying to do, uh, and, and I think it creates a more healthy and balanced relationship between you and whoever uh, or whatever the the partnership that you're forming is. So I I would second or third <laughs> <laughs> what you guys have been saying, but also, and it's kind of morphing a little bit, some of this is how do you choose what you're going to do and how do you figure that out? And one thing that I think is really important is to find the project that needs you, not necessarily just the project you want. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of projects, but everybody has their own unique skill set, their own unique way of interacting with people, and their own unique body of knowledge and ways that they can be most effective. You know that better than anybody else, most likely. And uh, so another thing to consider when you're looking at projects, for whatever reason, is that uh, you'll have an array of projects to look at, but some of them will be more suited to you or less suited to um, your being super effective there. And ones will be, you would be more interested in. You want something that makes you light up, not one that you're doing just because you think it's great. You know, it'll have great effects. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, uh, that's another piece of it. I, and let me just point out, University of Chicago's value in the world has often been so-called basic research. And some of that basic research may not look immediately like it has a super effect, but if you can figure out how to communicate the implications of some of that research that's not necessarily directly impacting, uh, but could be fundamentally useful, then that's also very useful. Communication is huge in all of this. So, so can I, it's, it's not a pushback, but maybe an addition <laughs> or... Okay, okay. <laughs> and, that, well, and maybe it's a pushback, because that's what we do here. Um, yeah. So I, I think also there's this question about kind of the ethics of, of action research, if we mm -hmm. would call it that, or, and I keep going back to the word of partnership, because I actually mm -hmm. do believe that there are different forms of kind of doing action research. research. And, and I, I think that if you're building a partnership with someone and you expect to work with them over the long haul, meaning extended, sustained engagement, there are actually going to be times when you do things that you don't want to do. Right? There are going to be times when a community-based organization that you're working with needs something. And I, for example, I hate evaluations. I do not do evaluations. But there are times when a community-based organization needs someone to help them think about an evaluation because, in fact, their funding depends on it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a partner and, and kind of invested in that organization, I have to do that work with them. Right? So that, in fact, there are moments when I'm asking them to do things that benefit kind of basic research that they might not see exactly what the payoff is for, for the people that they work with. And so I, I think there are moments when you, when you are doing work that you don't like. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't define what you do, because if that's the case, then you probably have the wrong partnership. But um, it's not always, I would guess, at least in my experience, going to fit exactly what you've what you've determined is kind of the optimal project for you. Oh, very much I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I'm talking about deciding whether you want to you know, save the whales or possibly uh, save the, um, uh, the south side. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. yes. then you want to figure out where these things um, where these things fit you. Absolutely. Then once you've decided a project, it's like getting married. You, know, you can't reform them. 
I, honest, I've tried. You know? <laughs> We're still married. <laughs> but you'd be surprised. People are people. And, and in some sense, organizations and projects and uh, the South Side has its own characteristics that you cannot control and there's nothing you can do about them. Mm -hmm. um, no, I live in Hyde Park, that's why I'm picking on the south side. But uh, uh, any project you pick up is going to have its own personality. That's why you want it to match. You are getting married in some sense. That's why you want it to, to be a, a good fit. So, and the panel that we have here happens to all have sort of a particular bent. I will say that corporations are actually also coming to us more and more and wanting to have partners uh, with research. And this has its own set of ethical concerns and questions and things you want to think through, but, but it is the case that uh, even if you were to stay within academia and not go work for a corporation, that they're very interested in the skill sets that our students have and, and what you can bring to them um, so all sorts of different marketing corporations, of course, are very interested in the sorts of things that our psychology and our econ students um, might be studying, um, but just a whole range of corporations. And we have, we just rolled out uh, this week an announcement about uh, an internship program for doctoral students. Um, and this grows out of uh, a range of institutions and corporations being interested in having our students and the skills that they have. So, you know, it's worth thinking about uh, I, of course, am sort of in the same vent that they are, that, that we should try to save the world and, um, or save the South Side or the whales or all of these things. Um, but that's not necessarily the only way that your research um, can have real world impact or it can be sort of action based. As a graduate student, I worked for First Chicago. Do you remember First Chicago? <laughs> Back when there was one. And, and, and I, can, I can second that one too. Mm -hmm. I was a regular bank economist, at, but that allowed me to choose research projects of my own as well. Um, First Chicago as a financial, that's now J.P. Morgan Chase. Just on, uh, it was interested in predicting how the world was going. That as a banking institution and banking institution in Chicago, they don't win if Chicago falls apart. They, they are very, or were at that time anyway, very invested in the success of the city as well as the, uh, their bottom line. And in the economics forecasting division where we were, they wanted to know what the world looks like in an unbiased way and then potentially what they could be doing about it, if anything. And with limits, being a, a, a profit maximizing institution as it is. But, you know, profits are, are not necessarily a bad thing. They provide incentives. And uh, my husband spent his whole career as a researcher at uh, the um, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And they, too, are always looking for something new. So I can tell you what you learn at the University of Chicago is how to think. And how to think is a skill that applies across an enormous range of possibilities. One of the, you know, I'm in conversations right now with uh, doing on social media with kind of Facebook and Twitter and Google and, you know, their, their information is way, way, way behind lock and key and it would be great to have access to it. But in terms of just the skills that we're learning, you know, it was very difficult for me to even think about how a lot of the quantitative and qualitative, you know, classes I was taking would extend beyond uh, kind of writing quality papers and dissertations, but you know they're looking for people right now that know how to do those skills to understand you know a, how to you know maximize or make some of these companies more profitable, but also you know with civic ed, with a civic focus being uh, emphasized with the tools of Facebook, or Twitter, social media, uh, vines, what have you, they're thinking about getting in, getting and being more active in this kind of civic space, and that may may open up different partnerships and realities for. Uh, working with researchers that may also be interested in that. Uh, but it does raise concerns and questions mm -hmm. over, over you know, but who's doing what, what, what their ends are, how long can you build that partnership, what are you getting out of it? But you know, these conversations are happening, I think they require a lot of thinking you know, from a student perspective on what, what it means to get, uh, to try to pursue and, and possibly to be engaged with groups like that uh, for my own research purposes and their ends, whether it's good or bad, or whether I start to agree or disagree with what they do. I, mean, I would just add to what uh, Alan 
is saying in particular about Google and Facebook and Twitter and those places is that it also isn't, you know, you hear a kind of quantitative bent here if you're able to kind of handle big data in the era of big data, which this is, right, then in fact you can kind of go out into the world. These institutions or entities are also interested actually in qualitative researchers who can do kind of ethnographic work, who can give kind of greater detail in thinking about kind of why people are going to certain sites, how networks work and things of that sort. So this possibility isn't kind of limited to those who are quantitatively, um, I guess, invested, but in fact holds a possibility, it's a possibility for, for lots of folks who are here at the university. And you know, it's really rare and not so, um, uh, and not, uh, you don't find it so much in the, in the academy as well, is the ability to translate numbers into words mm -hmm. that people can understand. Mm -hmm. That if you can communicate, and that's, a, that's really what we're talking about here, how do you get research on research results of all kinds. If you can communicate outside jargon, in other words, in words other people can understand, then that is a skill that translates across whatever platform you want to use it on and one that you can take wherever you want to take it. And use it for good, not for evil, okay? <laughs> Do you have any examples of, of conversations like that, that where you know you've had data that you understand that you know the people your your partners with don't necessarily understand that you know you've had to do that kind of translation? You're talking to an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Can you expand upon some of the <laughs> conversations? <laughs> Economists are the only ones who can be boring without, <laughs> without anybody ever understanding what they're being boring about. Oh. I'd, Economists are, uh, uh, we live our lives thinking we're misunderstood, essentially, <laughs> because everybody, th uh, uh, anybody here at econ grad students? Okay, <laughs> so you keep quiet. <laughs> everybody else, what's the first word that comes in when you're thinking about money? I mean, about econ, uh, there, see, I said it. <laughs> economics, it's money, right? <laughs> and economists don't think that way. What's economics about? Markets. <laughs> markets, yeah. And what makes a market is incentives and trading. And incentives and trading, you know, money can be evil, but incentives and trading are just um, ways we interact. <laughs> Understanding that economists are talking about ways people interact in a lot of our stuff, rather than roots of all evil, is a, it is a fundamental way economists mm -hmm. are misunderstood by the regular public. Can I give an example sure, about yeah. people being uh, misunderstood or data being misunderstood? So we do a quarterly survey through the Black Youth Project of uh, young people 15 to 25 where we are looking at all sorts of things, but largely their civic and political attitudes and engagement. Um, and we thought, we said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll put this in a very streamlined form. We will write a five to 10 page memo. Uh, and we had a group of um, community organizers, young people who run NGOs, Rock the Vote, you know, Rock the Vote, all kinds of organizations that you might know. And they were like, okay, why are you giving us something 10 pages, <laughs> right? So they were like, can you just kind of scale it down to two or three pages, really highlight the numbers and the just kind of frequencies uh, that, were, that are important and give us some sense of what are, what are the implications of this analysis for the work that we're doing. So I mean, you can even think you're streamlining it. And sometimes it is that back and forth, the kind of test uh, sample that says, no, 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 no. What you look, <laughs> think is easy is just not, it's not that simple. So please, uh, kind of, it, this question again, translate it or help, let us help you translate it in a way that will be much more effective for us. Yeah. The back and forth is key. I did some research a few years back on uh, the uh, career and tech ed programs wanted to know whether they were working or not. So they gave me the data on their students for a few years and said, uh, try to figure out whether these are working or not. And the statistics are kind of high wrangling. For our econ person, um, I did nearest neighbor matching techniques with a difference in differences approach. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, of course, they didn't care. That mattered to the a statistician who's looking at it saying, is this legit? So it matters to the researchers, it didn't matter to them. What they wanted to know is, and then I had to figure out how to put it. Okay, if I matched up two people at the same high school who were, to my eyes, statistically the same, and one did the career and tech ed uh, uh, program and the other one didn't, 
the career and tech ed person was more likely to graduate, got a higher grade point average, had higher attendance their senior year, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was the kind of thing they could understand and see, and that kind of results-oriented stuff was backed up by the statistics, but isn't, isn't what they're interested in. And um, in my experience, a business person wants one page. You know, going on to two is kind of okay, but you're getting a little long. But one of the other things that's important, and you know, this is maybe because I'm earlier in the process, is you know, when you're working with other folks, to also be clear that you're understanding you know, the terms that they're using and what they're mm -hmm. looking for. So uh, a project I'm working with uh, on now uh, works with teachers and educators. And you know, having an idea of what you would like to accomplish and then talking to the people that you're going to be working with or possibly implementing the ideas that you're working on, you know, there are things about curriculum planning that I just had no idea about. Just, just you know, we could talk about kind of broader things we would like to accomplish and perhaps things, you know, outputs we would like to see, but how to do that in the education space um, over the course of one or maybe two semesters with all the other things that they have to deal with, you know, changes how the approach that we do, and the partnership and, and who's leaning on who. So being clear on both sides, I think is really important as well, because I see from time to time people coming in with a research or academic perspective, joining and partnering, thinking I have, I have these answers and I have these questions and I'm going to help just produce things for you. And it's really that back and forth that can really, I think, get to meeting the goals that you really want to and having the quality work that you're doing that can benefit both sides of, of a relationship. We're actually working. Um, truth, you, you probably didn't know <laughs> that um, this course that you guys are yeah, working on. All three of us are doing the same. We're actually all three working on that. Yeah. In the, um, I'm working on the personal finance semester, and they're working on the um, action civics semester. Mm -hmm. But it's a whole year long course. <laughs> we didn't know that we were involved in those. But, this wasn't planned. <laughs> beforehand, but we, the personal finance one is an initiative that's actually been going on for a little bit longer mm -hmm. because uh, if, you, if you're not Illinois high school graduates, you may not know that Illinois has a personal finance requirement, consumer ed requirement, to graduate from high school. It was written by, um, back 40 years maybe, by the home ec teachers, so there's a fiber requirement. If you did graduate from uh, an Illinois high school, are you aware of the difference between rayon and cotton? <laughs> No? <laughs> uh, that's too bad. <laughs> that's in there. But um, uh, we're trying, it, as part of this year-long course, to get high school students in Chicago, Chicago public school students, better prepared for society as they come out financially and in the civic mm -hmm. environment. And part of that involves action civics. Okay. Um, and, and personal finance action can be action civic. So we're trying to communicate what research is and how you do research through this project through teachers to students and have them do research. And I think that's part of both halves, isn't it? Yeah, it's part of both halves. I mean, part of what we're doing also is that there's a, you probably don't want to know all about, but Global Citizen Initiative and uh, the idea is how do you empower young people who are in high school with the skills so that they can be civically engaged both in high school and beyond high school. And so uh, we're working on that side, in particular building modules that allow them to do this type of engagement using new media or digital media. So. And then the challenge on all of that is that it's not just the teachers to the students that we so. need to worry about. The teachers are being evaluated by their principals and evaluated in a new way. It just changed the last couple of years. And so the principals aren't totally comfortable with it. The teachers aren't comfortable with it. And they also, neither side knows really how to match curriculum to it, which means teachers are doing unfamiliar curriculum being evaluated in an unfamiliar way with students who don't know what they're doing, supposed to be doing anyway. Now, do you think there are communication issues? <laughs> I mean, absolutely. So we have to figure out ways not only to communicate to teachers about what they're doing, but to communicate with teachers and with teachers to us on what they should be talking to their evaluators about. In other words, how to communicate it to not just their students, but the students' parents and the, and the people who are evaluating them, their principals, and anybody else who would be interested. So it's kind of a general communication morass of things that we have to figure out how to, how to be clear in. And then we have the citizenship versus personal finance divide. Yeah. Do you think it'd be 
possible to engage in these projects if you are not professors, or is the fact that you're all except for you, yeah, yeah. He's soon. professors, yeah. pre-professors, the credibility to do what you're doing? And I also have other questions, but I'll say. Well, I can tell you in the economic education environment, not everybody's a professor, although there's a whole national network of centers for economic education that are based in schools, in universities. But they aren't all staffed by professors. Sometimes they're staffed by retired teachers or, or administrators. And there's professor cred that you get, I'm PhD cred. If you've managed to do that, you get a little added gravitas that I can, I can pull on every once in a while. But that cuts both ways, because if you... Uh, it goes back to the stereotype of an econ professor, right? You all know you're, you're well, except our econ student. <laughs> Presumably you love us, but the rest, uh, the rest of the world, I'm, I'm not sure why we're so lovable, but they don't love us automatically. So it, it, it isn't automatically a, a positive necessarily. I have to fight that a fair amount. But it does, I can, I can stand up and say, well, I do have a PhD, and then, and, and, and don't um, don't think I don't pull the University of Chicago out. <laughs> you know, it's a known name. It's a brand. Mm -hmm. um, so that does make a difference. But in terms of does it make me know what I'm doing more? It's not the letters. It's what I learned, and it's the how to think that teaches mm -hmm. you um, how to be effective. And at the end of the day, that's what gets you the the ground on the, or the boots on the ground or or whatever metaphor you want to use. So, so can I just add to that? I mean, I, I think that's a great question and that was yeah. a great answer. But the, there, I think some indirect effects from being a professor. One is um, part of the reason we can do this work is that I have a big grant from the MacArthur Foundation. And I can bring money to that project, right? So they were already doing the Global Citizens Initiative. We wanted to figure out a way to kind of infuse uh, curriculum around new media into the public schools, especially around civics. They needed that component. How will we pay for it? Oh, we have this grant over here. Boy, it was a wonderful partnership, you know, when you can do that. So I think clearly when you walk in the door and you have a PhD from the University of Chicago, it makes a difference. And then if you have a, a PhD from the University of Chicago, you might be more likely to also be able to secure resources. You have space on campus. You know, there is a way in which I think at least our teachers are always kind of excited about coming to the university for, um, you know, professional development. So I think there are lots of resources that come with being a professor as well as being here that kind of facilitate or at least supports the uh, ability to do that type of work. So these aren't really alternative careers then? Because yeah, not you are professors, but what about the many of us who are not going to be able to get jobs as professors? How would you get involved in something like that if you can't say, well, I'm a professor at the University of Chicago? But I, I don't think it's that you have to be a professor. So I have a student, well, I had a student. I worked with a student, Marissa Guerrero, who uh, received her PhD and decided, let's say four years in, and she was a great student. She was going to get, a, I thought, a fabulous job, right? And she was like, I don't really want to do this, Kathy. I was like, OK, so let's think about what you might want to do. And she wanted to run or be an official you know, a VP at a really significant NGO in California. And so she went about making connections and interviewing. And it really mattered to them that she was, she was going to get, and she did get her PhD from the University of Chicago. It was a credential that kind of traveled with her, right? It, even though the job was in California, they had all heard of the University of Chicago. They understood the rigor of getting a PhD here or an MA here. And that was really important to her landing that type of job. It was not just the credentials that she had incredible skills. She right. could write. She could research both quantitatively and qualitatively. She could translate, uh, translate research, right? So she was a kind of total package. And she was an amazing fundraiser, right? She helped me raise some funds. So. Um, so I don't think it's just being a professor. I think it's having a certain type of experience, being able to articulate what skills you, you get from that experience and what you're going to bring to that job and how you're going to help that organization grow. Uh, and I think that is the difference problem. Yeah, and I, oh, I was oh, going to say, oh, no. yeah, I'll just slip it in and then you go. Um, that you know, we have a, our, our, alum are, our alumni are doing fantastic things. Um, and so our MAPS alumni and our PhD alumni 
um, and not all of them are in academic careers. It happens to be the case that for a long time, the people we've known the best, the people we've had the best information about are the people who are in academia. And so those are the people we can find the most easily and those are the people we sort of have the best network with. Um, but we're doing a project this year to, to really find all of our alumni from the past 15 years. Um, and we're finding some great people who are doing amazing things. Now they're less likely to be easily able to come back to campus to talk, although that's something we want to try to work on as we expand this program more. Um, but you know, we've got people doing an, a lot of this kind of research and who are in interesting institutions and corporations and uh, in government. And you know, so that is something I think that these skills really do translate and, and people really do see that this is an important degree, even if you're not in academia. And it just means, you know, as Kathy's saying, sort of working different channels. Um, but that's something that, that we definitely are, are very cognizant of and, and want to be thinking about. I just want to add real quick, you know, you know going on the idea of uh, the university and the PhD from the university signaling a set of skills that you need to go in the room and justify. You, it's also important to be conscious of the place and interpretation depending on what you're trying to do and what organization, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the city of Chicago, but uh, around urban issues uh, in, in different cities, there's a reputation that comes as well. And I think it's your job with the skills that you have, uh, along with research skills, qualitative, quantitative, uh, the ability to write, you know, also present what you were doing and what you took away from the institution. I think that's also something that can't really, you know, be forgotten that you may come from this place that has this rich, you know, reputation, but you as an ind individual, you know, need to assert yourself and what you're going to bring to the table, regardless if you're uh, a professor, hopefully I'll be there one day, or, or, or not. Yeah. I was just curious about partnerships, mm. I know you were talking a little bit about finances. Um, are those the only types of partnerships that exist, or can you be, you work with an organization without actually bringing money in, mm -hmm. oh. and how would that look like? <laughs> Well, I mean, I th I'll just give me examples. So um, this summer we worked with um, QCDC, Quad City Development Corporation. Ooh, I better make sure I have that one right. Uh, <laughs> and the idea was um, we wanted to, to pilot a research institute. And the idea was that we would bring 25 young people who were in the Chicago public schools. We kind of engage them for six weeks uh, in research skills in particular. So uh, people probably remember all of the um, gun violence that was being written about. And we thought it was very interesting that disproportionate victims of that gun violence were young people, but oftentimes they were kind of missing their voices from the story. Uh, except when a reporter kind of pulled one aside and got a quote. And we wanted to train young people so that they could go back into their schools, for example, field a survey, create a report and then they could kind of represent what young people actually thought about this. We didn't have money to do this, but we had certain resources. We had the University of Chicago. We actually held our classes in social science. We had graduate students who were willing to work as um, instructors. So there were three, four graduate students who worked on this. And then we went out and found money. QCDC found money and we found money. We didn't find more than they did. It was really uh, an agreed upon need that we wanted to both, you know, a project we both wanted to do, and we decided we would try to find the money together. They had all kinds of skills that I didn't. They found after school matter money. There's a whole bureaucracy there that I had no idea how to navigate. They did, and so it seems to me, again, this is a kind of the question of partnership. Sometimes you bring money, sometimes you bring expertise, sometimes you bring networks. It just, it just depends on kind of what you have and what they have. And if you put it together, does it work to build the project that you want to pursue? Yeah, and sometimes you don't even need very much money. Yeah. And so still bringing money perhaps to the table, but you know, we have students who go and do field work. Um, in various places. And so they're studying within a community and they need to hire research assistants and they have very, very, very small grants to do this, maybe $2,000. But it's enough that they can hire someone in the community to help them do the field work that they're doing. And so that becomes a partnership. I mean, these are people who are experts on where they live and the, the people in their community. And, and so they really do become partners in that way. And yes, they're getting a little bit of money out of it, um, but really it's, 
uh, a lot of ways it's they're being recognized, their you know, community is being recognized in a way that it isn't. Um, the research that's being done can then be brought back to them to help them understand things that are going on in their community. And so they become really good partnerships with very, very little money on the table. I'm really blatant about it. I tell them, guys, you can have my body for free, <laughs> meaning I'll help you as much as I can, just me. It takes, I have to hire somebody if you want more than that. But I, I operate on, if, if we can get money, that's great. And sometimes we can get big money, but mostly it's little money. But uh, you'd be surprised what you can do with small amounts. Because again, if you have the skills to look for what's new and to recognize something that's new and to actually analyze it, that's, that you've got, that doesn't require additional money. Um, what would you do with a situation where you're getting out as a graduate student, not as a PhD student, but it's to the graduate level, and your interests are still a little I don't know, vague or difficult to explain. You don't necessarily, you find that you want to work with someone, but you want maybe an NGO or a think tank, but they don't know that they can capitalize on your uh, skills yet. Uh, let me give an ex uh, like for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in studying the language used in negotiations, especially, especially in uh, conflict zones. So I've been in touch with a uh, think tank in Kabul. Uh, and I, I think uh, from what I've heard, uh, there isn't any comprehensive ethnography that's been done in uh, Afghanistan. And I, I believe, I mean, a lot of security analysts say that it's going to be important to know uh, who, who, who's living inside, how much money they have, what, what their incomes are like, and that there's no comprehensive data on that. So that is something that I would like to go to the think tank and say, hey, you have the money, I have the skills. Uh, let me not sound presumptuous, but I think I can help out with that. How do you approach a situation like that without sounding cocky? I think the first thing you need to, to do is make sure that the organization you're looking at uh, that, that whatever you think you can bring to the table, even if it's not you know, crystallized into this kind of perfect uh, pitch, is, is something that you can contribute to. And that's not an issue, in my mind at least, uh, of cockiness, but really making sure that you're bringing something that fits into the mission of that organization. And so that it's not just a uh, partnership of convenience that you happen to know someone and you've been in contact, but really that this eth uh, ethnographic study, study is going to be something that they can tangibly and easily you know, merge into the values and the mission statement of that organization. And, and you know, that's something that I think to be really, really, really clear on early on in your process and thinking of if this is the best organization for me or if I need to, to build different school, skills or, or develop different types of training that would be more in line with what they want to do. And you know, certainly with your interests as well. But you know, it, it's not very easy and I personally would encourage going to an organization and stretching the boundaries of, say, their mission or, or their objectives um, and fitting in into what you want to do. And I think looking at those things and outlining very clearly for you what you're hoping to get out of this, either for potential graduate work or for other motivations that, you know, of, of interest that you're looking at. But really making sure those are in line can help you find the right organization that may speak better to what you're trying to do. And when you make that match, just remember, confidence isn't necessarily being cocky. And uh, being, uh, believing in something isn't the same as being cocky. Cocky is, is uh, uh, a different thing, but it's, uh, it's pushing it over the edge of, um, uh, of acceptability. And that starts reminding you when uh, women often think we're being cocky when all we're doing is being confident mm -hmm. and don't, uh, don't Bad mouth yourself if that's what's going on. Yeah, I think too, you want to use the resources you have here while you're here. So we have an Office of Career Advancement that will be happy to help you think through those kinds of issues, make sure that you know, the resume that you present to this organization is tailored for this organization, that you can write um, a letter, you know, so similar to a cover letter, but you're not 
necessarily applying for a position they already have posted, but a letter that will explain what you want to do. Um, we've got a great alumni network here that you can tap into, um, and MAPS, especially your MAPS, uh, so MAPS especially is really building their alumni network right now. And I think using that, you know, really tapping into that and saying, is there anyone, maybe not at that organization, but a similar one who could, who could help me either think through this or has a contact that they can get me in touch with? You know, I think that those are the kinds of things that are becoming increasingly important in, in finding jobs and finding you know, projects in ways into projects like this. And so I think learning that, using the things you have here while you're here, but then learning those skills too is, is really crucial for sort of moving forward. So what, where are these actual research jobs? Like when I type that in, <laughs> it doesn't, like there's nothing like this. So I mean, it's great that you guys are saying it exists. I'd mm -hmm. love to do it. I just can't find it. So how do I go about doing that? Well, I think they're at, so the, the reason you're not finding it sort of as a category, I think, is because these kind of jobs exist in a whole range of different kinds of organizations. And so, uh, you know, we've talked about NGOs. A lot of NGOs are going to have jobs where, you know, a, a research kind of position could be found, whether or not they have one right now, maybe they'll find funding and, and could use somebody like that. Um, Certainly, not just NGOs, but governmental organizations as well. Um, and we've got a lot of alumni working in government at various levels, um, and often doing research that you know very clearly is going to have real-world implications. Um, universities, not just as a professor, but universities have lots and lots and lots of research centers. Okay. Um, and those people are not always PhDs, they're not always professors, um, but all universities appreciate graduate level degrees. <laughs> I will say that as someone who left a PhD program with an MA and had trouble finding work outside in the corporate world and you know went to a university where they said, of course your skills are valuable. Um, but universities are a great place to find research jobs um, of all sorts uh, and can then be a stepping stone to other things. So I think it's difficult to find these jobs just as a category, but if you look, you know, if you look for terms like research center or things like that, you might be able to find things. I also think that we're calling it action research, but I think outside the academy, <laughs> research is actually usually thought of as <laughs> being used for action. So it is, it is our position that we would say action research. Uh, so I think, as you just said, I mean, most of these places are engaged in kind of data analysis and other forms of research, and maybe that's the type of job. And you know, you also want to think about what are the relationships I can build now by volunteering mm -hmm. with groups in and around Chicago that will then provide you access to networks of people where you know they might post a job or they might not post a job and you would hear about different types of jobs um, through those networks. She's had it. Awesome. I'm a preschool teacher. I'm currently in the math program um, and I have a question for people coming at this from the other side of the research. Um, so I have a lot of colleagues I think, you know, for, for within the school specifically, the, we have a lot of graduate students here who do research in schools, um, and they're usually either in our comparative human development department or in the psychology department uh, working on developmental psychology. Um, and so, you know, I happen to know people here, but I think that's true any graduate program anywhere around here, that there are going to be people doing that kind of research. And so I think, you know, as an individual faculty member wanting someone to come in and, and come to their uh, classroom, I think approaching graduate students, if you can find them, is an excellent way because those are people who are trying to form relationships with one teacher or three teachers that they can be in that classroom um, and not necessarily part of a larger study, but this is a you know, sort of micro level study that they're doing. Um, I think if, if they reach out to any developmental psychology or, you know, part of human development kind of program that there would be lots of people happy <laughs> uh, to have someone who wants, you know, wants people in the classroom because that's something they sometimes struggle with when they're putting their, 
you know, they have a great research plan. I, you know, I want to go into a preschool classroom. I want to go into a third grade classroom, but they don't necessarily have any contacts. And so if someone reaches out to them, I think that'd be very welcome. I think you could build that network. I think that sounds like a great plan for you. <laughs> See, I was going to say, that sounds like a great plan for the division. To, I mean, just yeah. you had a website where yeah. if you'd like to volunteer your whatever, your classroom, your organization for research, yeah. sign, here's the form, a very short form, and then scholars could go to that site and say, oh, look, we actually talked about building this type of relationship in the city of Chicago, a number of organizations where you could try to match people. It's kind of like match.com for researchers or something. Um, <laughs> a little scary, but um, so you know, that might be something that the division would take up. You divisional reps who are in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll look into it and, uh, <laughs> and let you know. Um, yeah, I think it could be. And they, you know, there, there is something similar with individual children. So our developmental psychology people do have parents bring their children in to have research done. And they, you know, they've got a Facebook group and a website. And so if you're interested, you just sort of sign up. My son has done like 12 different studies. And it's really exciting. And you know, we don't, I, I think maybe they give us money for parking or something. But you don't get anything out of it except that you know that you're contributing to research. And it's pretty exciting to see it. And you get the results later. And so I, you know, I think that sort of thing exists. And not just here. Northwestern has something similar. I'm sure lots of places do. Uh, for the sort of individual level, so I don't see why that couldn't be expanded to, to be sort of a, a classroom level thing as well. Yes? I was just wondering if you could maybe talk more about like different kind of research and what you can contribute, because I feel like a lot of it, in a lot of like, like most organizations value like, like numbers and statistical analysis, and people like really believe in that, and they also have some like, well, we can't do all these numbers, so we would need to bring somebody in. Uh, but I'm doing a linguistic anthropology and I feel like everybody feels like an expert on culture. And, <laughs> and then they're like, well, we don't meet you. We totally get everything. Right. So like, how would one like market something like that, especially when what you're bringing in is, I don't know, some qualitative research skills and like a lot of theory that is kind of really complex that you kind of have to and use yeah. in on one page, which we can't. Yeah. It, it gets more difficult than others. Mm -hmm. But I, I still I really think it's valuable. Yeah, but how would you translate that? Present it. Yeah, I mean, I think knowing sort of the audiences that are already receptive to that can, can be a good start. So, you know, I've mentioned research centers and, and university campuses are going to be very receptive to that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, you know, places like you can get funding through something like the Fulbright Commission to go and do some research, and then you've got kind of a, a body of research like that, and you can make connections while you're in the field with, with other people uh, who find that work valuable already. And so sort of starting that way might, might be the easiest way to sort of figure out how to, to present this to people who are going to be receptive to it. I mean, I think the biggest challenge really with that is not necessarily that the audiences don't find it valuable, but that the funding agencies sometimes don't find it valuable. And so, you know, a lot of government funding, for instance, is very numbers driven. Um, and so finding agencies who, you know, might think it's great to do that kind of thing, um, but have to have funding from somewhere else. So places that are funded instead of by government, by the Mellon Foundation, for instance, you know, might be much better fit for that kind of research. And so I think that's one of the things, is just sort of figuring out who is likely to be receptive to this in the first place. I mean, action and activist type organizations as well, uh, you know, just from experience, people that are members in those groups already have a, have a much in my experience, easier time translating over these types of skills, and in fact, you know, forming these partnerships, whatever they, whatever they may look like. But um, the idea of, you know, it may not be numbers driven, but how do I take this 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 idea or this movement that 
I care about and my 30 consistent members care about, how do I take that and expand it? You know, you know not you, but there are people who say, you understand um, you know, social networking. You understand the hierarchies and how, how political action happens. Tell us how we can go from 30 people to 300 people that has some kind of voice that's sustained. How do we get media attention? What do we do to, to deal with conflict and build action? I mean, there are folks that, that study this and have studied it over time. People that are in these organizations already and understand the culture there, and they have an easier time of bringing in you know, you're someone that can, that can speak to these five things. It may not be all the things, but I think it's kind of a step-by-step -step process of really knowing the organization and then trying to, to, to build the bridges versus kind of come from an outside and say, hey, organization that's doing this, you know, I have this level of expertise in, in X. Let me, let me try to facilitate those connections. Ab absent where they're more receptive, um, either funders or organizations already doing this. Actually, it can be a disaster if you walk in and say, here, use me, because they have no idea how to use you. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then that usually, in my experience, means you're taking notes or something. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, they, they don't understand what your expertise can do. If you, um, if you have enough knowledge of what they're doing to be able to show them something that they should be doing differently exactly. and how it could benefit them, then that's a good way to show them that there's some value, too. In, in whatever you're doing, and that could be with numbers or it could be with, with qualitative um, analyses or it could just be with an approach to things. And it could start small. It could be very, you know, talking to a couple of people and, and it could take time, but I think building that, having some kind of basis and foundation in the group in some capacity, whether you're attending meetings frequently or, you know, a lot of members can help ease the tension of, I'm the outsider that's going to tell you how to make things better versus, you know, I have some kind of, you know, understanding that's been communicated or, or displayed before. And this is where, you know, we can improve things. That, I mean, that language, that kind of um, back and forth is really, really helpful in that regard. I was just going to say, I think there are a couple other things. One is, you know, we're giving you this kind of general advice, and it changes, of course, depending on your area. So the first thing I would do is try to figure out, are there people who, do the work that you do in linguistics, and who are already doing what we are talking about as action research. And so I try to identify those folks and have a conversation with them. How did they make that leap, given the skill set that, that they have and you guys share? The other thing is, if you can kind of think already about practical ways in which your research really could benefit certain organizations. Like when I heard you, I thought, well, schools. Schools are always thinking about kind of linguistics and um, questions of culture and differing cultures and which cultures have uh, significance and the same structures and things of that sort as they build things like curriculum or they evaluate kind of the work that their young people are doing or the resources that they bring into the building. And so if you can identify kind of practical ways uh, that an organization would benefit, and I think this is what we were saying before, then I think you can approach them in a different manner than because I think sometimes you have to do the, help them do that work, right? There are ways over time that organizations now know they have to have yeah. data, right? Because every foundation, every funder has said, we want to measure your outcomes. Sometimes they don't know the work that you're doing can be translated into that type of data. It can be utilized for the programs that they're, um, that they're implementing. And I think you have to help them understand what you bring uh, into the room and not just kind of come into the room. Yeah. I mean, that can be critical for understanding the numbers, even if you're not doing Absolutely. the numbers. But not, uh, the other thing is that you brought up informational interviews. That's uh, mm. it, outside academe, into informational interviews are the way you find all this stuff out basically. Mm -hmm. And there's no commitment on either side, but just about anybody's willing to come in, and talk to you for an informational interview um, uh, in, in business, in NGOs, in, in all sorts of different areas. And, and, and that's, how, that's how you find stuff out. An informational interview just says, look, here I am. Um, I'm not sure exactly what these are the kinds of things I'm interested in. And they say, well, here we are. These are the kinds of things we're interested in. And you talk. Yeah, I, I would second that. I, people come to me all the time, graduate students in the division, who are interested in doing higher ed administration. And I love the informational interview. I love you know, helping them learn about what I do. It's very flattering when someone says, 
you're doing a really interesting job. Can I hear more about it? And so I think if you can identify those people who are doing this kind of work already, and, and they're going to be more than happy to talk to you about what they're doing. If I can follow up, I'm just wondering, I don't know, you're talking about kind of like skills and how you know, present your skills together. And then you're like in academia, you have like your CV, and then like your <laughs> publishing history, and like articles that you published. I was like wondering if we're like looking for non academic Yeah, I think you have to be really careful about how you do it. I think um, your online presence can be very tricky. I think, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that that can be really helpful. Um, and actually, one of our future sessions we hope to have probably in spring, we want to talk a little bit more about that about sort of people's presence online. You know, having your own YouTube channel or LinkedIn or you know these various kinds of things that you can use. Um, I. It's going to depend from organization to organization whether they're going to look at that, whether they're going to want to look at it. Um, but I think if you do it well, it can't hurt to, to have that presence, certainly. Um, I would definitely think about how to translate a CV into a resume, because there are places where having a resume is going to be far more important. And it is really, really hard to get things down to one page. I have actually never succeeded. My resume is two pages. Um, but you know, getting that down to one page and getting a really strong cover letter, um, learning how to really tailor a cover letter to a particular organization, to a particular position, I think is just crucial to that sort of thing. Because you're sometimes not going to have very long to present yourself. You're not going to get people's attention for, for very long. And so if you can sort of really make an impact right at the first moment that they're looking at you, that can be really big. And of course, networking, if you can have somebody else make that introduction, all the better. One last point on this, you know, increasingly with our graduate students, we insist, don't always get, we insist that they publish a piece, right? Because in fact, we are now in a job market where, uh, you know, your future employers want to know that you're a productive person, that you know how to publish an article. Uh, I think what would distinguish you in terms of this type of work from all the other academics out there who are kind of not sure what they want to do and apply is if there's a small piece where you've already done the translation of academic work into work that is, I don't want to say just pragmatic, but at least uh, accessible to folks outside the academy, just a small piece, two or three pages. I think that helps mm -hmm. say to someone, she's invested in this enough that she's done this work and she's not just, I mean, look, it's great if students are interested, but if a student comes and has done this work already and kind of knows what it takes, I, I think it makes people pay attention to you. So in the same way that we want an article from graduate students, I think a small translated piece w wouldn't hurt. Mm -hmm. That's true. Dr. Roberts, this is actually a question for you. You were, uh, I really like the analogy about marriage and these partnerships and starting early. And um, my question is, how do you, you know, once you get to that point in time where this partnership looks like it's not really going to work out, how do you separate from an organization without you know, tarnishing the brand that you represent and really kind of leaving the door open for all future researchers? Well, that's a good point because there's no official divorce. And, and certainly not a no fault, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's what you're saying. How do, how do, you, um, uh, how do you make those changes? And... Uh, in my experience, I haven't had uh, I haven't had a, a partnership that didn't go through stages anyway. And a st at given stages, I might be more or less appropriate to be the, the a lead partner, or even a partner at all. And so those changes happen naturally anyway. It's a little different from taking a job and then leaving a job. Um, but mostly with jobs too, there are natural transition points. And if you're feeling you are, have almost had enough with this, they probably are too. That's, that's the other thing on marriage sometimes. <laughs> I, I only got married once, okay? I only <laughs> want to be married once, so I haven't been through an end of a marriage. Um, but it, it, it always struck me on, when I've observed other people that it, I always sort of thought, it looked like maybe things should come to an end, even if they kind of didn't, and mm. one or the other wasn't really aware of it. So it may be if you're thinking this partnership might be coming to an end, all you need is, is um, tact so that it can end gracefully as opposed to ending um, uh, 
uh, as opposed to ending with some horrible uh, uh, disaster. And most of these relationships that we're talking about when we're doing a, a research project have a natural ending when you publish the research, for instance. I, I don't expect to be involved with a personal finance half of the um, personal finance course initiative at Chicago Public Schools that's been going on for several years now, forever, that for one thing, the big grant runs out next year. <laughs> that's, a, that's a natural ending point for a lot of involvement. And, then, and for another, as the thing morphs, what you want them to do is grow up in the sense of, I, as an outsider, I'm being a little crutch trying to get them going until they can do it and set up their own virtuous cycle to keep going. And then that's the whole thing about researchers. This is the other, um, uh, the other analogy I always draw. Um, I, I get bored too easily. I want new stuff. I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And, and I don't like to teach the same class year after year after year and, I, and, and so on. And so the projects are set up to try to become self-sufficient. They need ownership anyway. They shouldn't be coming to me for it. So those kind of natural endings, I think, are uh, if, if the world is coming to you as the savior, Unless you're one or two really special people, and you know, I don't want to say you're not, but most of us we're kind of ordinary, just helping them along onto the next step. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you want to be careful too about what sort of commitments you do make when you're initially talking to an organization. You know, how you frame the conversation from the very beginning, I think, can help that ending. You know, if, if you are sort of selling yourself as you know, someone who's going to always be there for them, that's going to be very different than if you're saying, you know, I, I can help you with these few things, and then let's see where that goes. And so you know, that may be part of, part of something to think about as you're initially approaching organizations. And when I'm thinking about getting married to a research, I'm, I'm thinking an approach, not a particular organization, which I think also matters. Because human organizations tend to be imperfect, even GASP, the University of Chicago, <laughs> has a few, few minor imperfections, or imperfections, one of which they fix those. Aren't those chairs much better than they used to be? <laughs> They're I'm definitely better. more comfortable. They probably didn't know that chairs were before. They were wooden chairs. It was bad. Yeah. Oh, they were. That, for one thing, I have so many holes in, in um, <laughs> pants from the edges of those wooden chairs. Yeah, that's uh -huh. true. So can I just say, I have had a bad breakup, I mean, in my research, uh, <laughs> where uh, it just didn't work out. And it, I've only had one, I would say, and it wasn't easy, and I thought everything was clarified up front, and it just, we just couldn't work well together. It just, uh, there was a level of bureaucracy that I, I just, I mean, this is part of what many uh, CBOs and NGOs have to deal with. And as, you know, as a researcher, part of what you love about the University of Chicago is all the freedom that you have. And so this idea that we were constantly meeting, constantly, you know, making sure we were kind of doing dog and pony shows to make, get more fun, it got to a point where it just was, I had to say, look, I, I want this to succeed. I want to do everything I can to support this, but I can't be a central part of this anymore because it just doesn't work for me. And, you know, I think we all came away with it feeling like it was a little rough at first, but you know, I think we came away with it realizing that that was probably the best way for uh, us to kind of handle this, to kind of just separate and say, it was a great project, let's try to figure out how the project can succeed in the future, but I don't have to be the person doing that. And I think that's the other thing is, you know, we, we all have these skills, we don't have to think that in fact we're the reason the project succeeds, is that we can always also hopefully identify other people that can step in that might have a greater tolerance for kind of meeting constantly or something like that. Is, is there any, do you guys ever take the burden to like find somebody to replace you when they're still asking questions of you, you know, is there some kind of, uh, I say loyalty, but um, I don't know if that's really well, to me, it's not just about the project. Right? I mean, usually these projects are, are surrounding and supporting and empowering, for recently, young people. And I'm invested in those young people. So it would be ridiculous. It would be irresponsible for me to kind of leave a project and just say, well, I, I've had enough. Goodbye. I mean, so it is incumbent upon me to find someone who can step in. Again, this has only happened one time. Who can step in and do this? I mean, I, I think that's part of, to me, the ethics, which we haven't really talked a lot about, of what it means to be in partnership with 
entities that are outside the university that don't have the kind of buffers, the resources, all the things that we come to uh, kind of expect in life in terms of our work lives. And so um, when you enter into that, it's not I'm going to stay there as long as it benefits me. I'm going to stay there as long as I think the work I'm doing is a benefit to the organization also. And if I can't be there, I need to find someone who can be there if the project is going to continue. At least that's my, my perspective. Or, or I would say need to at least offer someone because they don't have to take the person oh, not at all. you offer well, yeah, of course. And, and so on. But there yeah. is a, an ongoing kind of idea that we're, that, that's the idea of a partnership as opposed to an, um, a contract job that's over when the contract's over or um, uh, something less, um, less formalized. Uh, you know, if you're doing something as a career, it's more than just a friendship that could just go on forever and ever. It, it's usually got a purpose, and that purpose might, um, uh, might have to find stages. And each of these points is a time to reevaluate who and what and how that you want to be achieving whatever your ultimate goals are. And those are also times to evaluate whether you're appropriate to be the, the person in the role that you've been. And it's that kind of conversation. It's not, a, not just you talking about you, but um, Notice I'm pointing to me when I say that. <laughs> uh, it's not just evaluation of uh, in the judgment sense, but it's trying to figure out what the best thing is at, at different times. The world changes. Mm -hmm. and of course, this is different if you are, you know, in a partnership. So you're still in graduate school, or you're a professor, and you're sort of in partnership. And it, it's very different if you are, in fact, working for an organization mm -hmm. or a government. Um, you know, and that's a whole different piece. Um, in some ways, that's easier to navigate, right? We all, we all know how to think about quitting a job and starting a new job. And you perhaps don't have the same sort of uh, ethical need to find someone else because that's what they're going to do. They're going to find someone else to fill the position. It's, you know, it's a job. They'll find someone. Um, so that can be completely different. And then there's a whole different set of ethical, in interesting ways of thinking about things, concerns if, um, if the organization is actually sponsoring your research. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I've talked about how there are increasingly corporations who are interested in talking to our graduate students um, and our faculty, certainly. And, you know, what does that mean if you're getting some sort of grant from a corporation who wants you to be doing research and all of a sudden maybe this isn't the kind of research you want to be doing or more to the point, this isn't an organization you want to be working with and, you know, what does that mean if you've agreed to take funding from a certain source and don't want to continue that relationship. And so that's something completely different to be thinking about um, that can also come up certainly in your careers. Can I just, just add, since uh, as a grad student, I don't really have access to a lot of money. <laughs> come like, on, come well, on. <laughs> I, I kind of like, well, my question also is because your reputational stake is heavy yeah. earlier on. So mm -hmm. it's like, right. I feel not necessarily trapped, but you know, if I jump out, it's like, all right, it's going to hurt me more than it would if I were tenured. Well, I, I think the, the important thing, and I, I haven't built kind of a, I haven't had to step away from a partnership uh, this far into my, my grad student experience, but I think it's important, and it sounds like, you know, we've all been alluding to really being clear and, you know, talking with the, the, the whoever you know, you're partnering with and making sure that it's not just once at the beginning and just, hey, a final conversation all of a sudden, I'm not really happy about that because you may be able to figure out what's actually bringing you apart. If it's more of a bureaucracy, a lot of asks on your time, if it's uh, more of the organization has, uh, you know, has grown and changed, that they've developed and they're focusing on something else, that your part has been minimized or has, is slowly being phased out. I think having that back and forth and realizing that the resource of time uh, is also really important and, you know, making sure that you're clear on those stakes if it's not just money, but, you know, whatever you have to offer, reputation, those kinds of things I think also matter. And so making sure that you're really, you know, being clear and intentional in being clear about what you're thinking about and how you feel the partnership is growing, either positively or negatively, can be important to make that easier when it's time, perhaps just to step away, that, you know, this doesn't come as a shock to you know, the group that you're working with. And if you're worried about the group responding in, um, 
in a negative way or something like that, and because that's the other thing people um, sometimes worry about. If it's not a happy breakup, if they wanted you to stay, and then now they're going to say things that maybe even aren't totally true about you afterwards, then the best defense on those things is to be as communicative and have that trail already so you can, uh, you can counter it um, completely, even unfair opposition. Um, it has never happened to me, but I, the University of Illinois president, I guess, just got flamed on the internet, if you want to look. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. 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 So uh, um, clearly it can happen in an academic setting, too, to very powerful people. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I've been through I, uh, the IRB training multiple, multiple times because you have to do it every two years, and and, uh, and it gets longer every time. <laughs> so, and I, and I don't know if you all have been through IRB training, but the way the way it works. Uh, it's different for each university you're in a little bit, but most universities use the city training um, through the Blackboard. And uh, so I don't know if University of Chicago does that too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and social science is different from the medical side, and so there are all sorts of flavors of IRB. So you just, does everyone know what IRB is? Should we maybe stop oh, that no, for anyone right. who Sorry. doesn't? <laughs> if you're doing human subjects research, and, and that means people. <laughs> There's a good chance the IRB cares about making sure you understand the ethics. On, and that's partly the power relationship between a researcher and the, pe uh, and the researchees, and partly an idea that not paying attention to this kind of thing in the past has wreaked some really pretty awful things in the world. I summarize it to people who don't, uh, to the, our grad students, by saying, okay, when did you last beat your wife? Anybody want to volunteer information? <laughs> uh, I'm, answering that question does what? Makes you confess to a crime, right? Mm -hmm. That's unethical. Or if you're going to ask a question that makes someone confess to a crime, you better have a really good <laughs> defensible reason for doing that. But people don't necessarily, I mean, that's a really kind of obvious thing. People don't necessarily understand the harm that can come to a to an individual person that you're looking at or to their family or to anybody else by perfectly sincere research questions. And finding out how to notice that stuff is what the Institutional Review Board um, oversight is trying to make sure happens. And each university has an Institutional Review Board that if you're doing something that qualifies as human subjects research, has to approve. And they're the ones who get to decide. So to your question, if they say it's human subjects research, it is, and then you have to do the IRB um, proposal and uh, do your research under their supervision, which may mean they actually um, come in and check on what's, uh, what's going on and often means they have to approve anything you're handing out to people or any ways you're doing your interactions. And, and, and if they say, no, this probably isn't, then... Um, you have a, a, a sort of ruling on what's going on. And then if you change it, you have to go back to them and say, well, now does this make this uh, research human subjects research and therefore sub, um, uh, subject to what you're talking about? So some of the things I've done with schools have qualified as human subjects research, and some have not. The project I alluded to about the uh, career and tech ed programs, for instance, was given an exemption because I had no idea who they were. It was all administrative data that they gave me. And so all I was doing was crunching numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then after I crunched the numbers, they told me which categories various things came to. So there wasn't any idea that any individual could be um, harmed by it. 
or very, very low probability anyway. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of the way they're making those decisions. But the ones who get to decide are the human subjects research um, people in, in the institutional re um, review board at a university. Uh, and there's an interesting, we keep going to partnerships. So I've worked in situations where community-based organizations wanted to know information um, that I thought would be valuable, but that I knew when we went through IRB would raise issues, right? And so also kind of trying to translate why we can't ask that question that you think is really important to ask, maybe about kind of experiences with gun violence or sexual assault or whatever it is, especially to, you know, because I do work with young people sometimes, the 15 to 17 year olds, very difficult um, category of, of subjects to get information from through IRB, at least according to IRB. So I think you also are always kind of doing that kind of work around with really huge NGOs. I work with some NGOs that have their own IRB, right? So it's just like they, they are, they're also uh, submitting in particular surveys to their review board. But a lot of community-based organizations don't have that. And so the kind of process, the, again, the bureaucratic process of the university can be a little off-putting and we just kind of negotiate what's going to go on the survey, what isn't, why we're going through this, my relationship to the university, my responsibility to the university and what I have to do. But, but I, that's I actually a selling point if you want to do research that the community-based organization wants to do. Because if they want to publish it in um, and get the kind of academic notice in mm -hmm. academic journals, it needs to have been through IRB approval. Universities <coughs> do that. That's a, a, a bit of value you can bring to them with <coughs> affiliation. <laughs> she looked like she had a flower. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I've never, I mean, I have to say, for the community based organizations I work with, they've never said, I want to publish this yeah. in, yeah. in a peer reviewed uh, journal. Now, I might say, what do we think about publishing this in a number of different venues, right? Mm -hmm. One might be peer-reviewed uh, journals or more accessible um, magazines or, you know, whatever, different outlets online and things like that. But, um, so I think it also depends on the size, who you're working with. with a, a lot of times, at least organizations I work they want data that can inform their usually organizing. Right. Right. What's the issue that we're organizing? What's the most effective campaign we can mount? How do we frame this? How do we evaluate it? How do we have data that we can say to people, do you know how many people in your neighborhood are unemployed or how many kids are dropping out or things like that? So it's, it's usually uh, a much more, I would get, I guess, contained uh, data project then. That some of maybe the ones mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's kind of like in, the fa in your family, your parents can ask you any questions they want. You know, um, your your CBOs can ask their people anything they want. It doesn't it, it doesn't count as research, right. but they can find answers. But if you want it to be publishable research that you can use, then it has to go through this approval. Um, and part of that has to be this outside expert coming in. It's this power right. issue because power. Well, we all know power can um, can be damaging to the people who are less powerful. So maybe just going off of that, I was wondering, so you talked about how we should like, develop relationships with our organizations at the time, so then how would you say, like, coming in, that we should, like, right away say, like, oh, I'm also, I don't know, interested in, like, research, and I might at some point in the future want to do something in research in IRB, or should we just kind of go there, maybe, like, volunteer intern, because we're really interested in a particular issue, and then later down the road, say, oh, we're also research and like what would be, I don't know, what would be like a meaning of that in terms of like thinking of what people have like said before they knew you were a researcher and what you might publish and I think it might get like tricky. Uh, so I was just yeah, wondering like how, how do you come in and at what point do you like come out as a researcher? <laughs> Well, I have this double life, so they all know that I'm a professor and do research, but I also do assistance. And, and, and so I come in and say, look, I, c I can help you along 
in, uh, along all these dimensions, you tell me what you want. And, and uh, sometimes, though, if, if it seems to be a group that's a, a little bit leery, I might even go ahead and say, look, I promise I won't use you for research without your wanting to be doing this. And you know, I'm not looking for rats, for lab rats. I, I, part of my job is to be just help and, and support. But if you want someone on, uh, someone on your side who can do research, basically, think of me too. And that's, uh, you know, so I do get calls from school systems and, and stuff offering me their data. And not so much because I think they, and they think I'm better just because they know my name. But, you know, let's not get too, uh, 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 too uh, egotistical about this. But they, I, so I don't think it's been a super issue in the idea of my doing research. Or not. But I, if, if I'm getting any vibe that they might be worried about it, I, I definitely reassure them that, no, I don't have a secret research agenda that this would get used for. I think it really depends on, on why you're joining that organization. So I, I've, I've group things, I guess I group this into two different sides, but my approach is the same ultimately. There are groups that I'm just generally interested in or may have a history with um, that I would join because I believe in what they do. Um, and then there are groups that uh, I may be also interested in, but from more of an academic perspective. But for both of those groups, you know, when I discuss who I am, a, you know, a big part of who I am is I'm a grad student. And the next you know, question is, well, what do you study? And so I say these things. Uh, if I'm interested in that second uh, group and I you know, want to try to figure out kind of what's going on, I, I think I'll be explicit. And we can have a conversation going forward that it may not be today or it may not be this year, but at some point, this is something I'm, I'm you know, feeling out my interest for. This is a great organization. Hopefully one day, if it's okay, we can have that conversation. But I think it being upfront about who you are really, I think, starts to build some level of trust so that you don't later down the line say, hey, all these meetings and these, uh, these different events uh, that I've been going to, I've been keeping this huge log of, I actually kind of now want to write about this. It, at that point, you, you, you really kind of undercut a relationship that just in organizations built around trust and things of that nature. So, you know, I, I think just being upfront helps and, and, you know, to clarify, if they are very uncomfortable with that, I think then the burden goes on you to say, I'm not going to use you for this. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to disrupt what's going on here. But I think that can't happen effectively, in my mind, uh, if you've been kind of collecting experiences, be it academic or otherwise, and then say, hey, I, I think I want to write about this, and I have these qualifications, and now you're just learning this. It makes me uncomfortable, and in my experiences, it's been really effective just being upfront at the beginning. Well, I think that's part of the point of IRB is that you can't take these right. conversations that you had earlier before you started this process and start writing them up in a journal. Um, and so you can you can explain that to a, I, I agree sure. that you should be upfront from the beginning, but you can say, you know, when I start collecting, you know, interview data or, or whatever it's going to be, you know, I, I will make it clear that at this point, this is when I'm starting collecting data for a research, mm -hmm. you know, and that it won't be just every conversation we've ever had. Now, I, I do think there's a complication that I've seen, and it is a graduate student who is committed to an issue who starts working with an organization and hits the moment when, mm. in fact, they need to write a dissertation and <laughs> starts, they start to think about kind of what do I want to write about. And they see this organization that they've been working with, that they love, that has raised really important issues for them, and it's that, like, how do you negotiate? Okay, I came in because I just love the organization, now I'd like to write about you. And I, and I do think you, you can't assume that just because you're there, that transition or that movement is okay. That again, that's something that has to be negotiated. But I often see graduate students at least getting inspiration for their dissertations based on some of the non-academic work that they're doing. So, I, yeah. so we're running out of time here. Maybe we can take one last question and, and then we'll wrap up. So. Um, yeah. Like sometimes there's pressure just to 
how to kind of market yourself. That's why it's good to be in the world. Well, I made the ultimate sacrifice, I guess you'd call it. Um, I took my job off the tenure track. So um, the half of my job that's the action research um, is an outreach center. And, and, and then the other half of my job is basically teaching and service and research. But um, I took it off. So I, I'm not under the tenure, um, uh, the tenure requirements in that, in that sense. And, and it doesn't come up. But that, that's a, I, I don't think of it as a sacrifice, okay? And it's worked out fine for me, and I have a very long-term job, and I'm not um, sitting there um, eating cat food, okay? <laughs> um, or whatever the, right. you're hearing about. <laughs> because in the academy here, as well as at, at University of Illinois, there are some perfectly fine non-tenured jobs. I, ma I made mine up, but um, there are all different, all different kinds involving research. So, um, uh, so in that, that's how I handled it. Yeah. I mean, for me, it, it never felt like a choice. I mean, I'm invested in the communities that I study. I came from those communities. Those are the people and the subjects that matter to me. And I think highlighting communities of color or poor communities, in fact, kind of stretches the boundaries of what we think of as political subjects and impacts the discipline. I, I couldn't, like, exist in an academy that said, you can't do that. I would probably just opt out. Um, and so for me, it's just kind of like, you do that work. Now, the reality is most of that work doesn't ever get counted. When I hand in my faculty report at the end of the year, I don't list all the community groups that I work with because truthfully, in most institutions like this, they don't really care about that unless it somehow makes it into the Washington Post or the New York Times, then it becomes a different um, experience. So I think you have to just decide, this is what I want to do. And I have always found ways, not just found ways, my community-based work has always kind of, I think, enriched what is thought of as my academic work. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the work on HIV and AIDS, and the, my first book, the Democracy Remix, I mean, I, I can go down the line and say, the, the distinction that people make, I don't make, right? Um, and so I, I think it's, it's like you said, you have to decide what's going to make you happy. Because you're going to hopefully be doing this a long time. It would be miserable to have the rest of your life and your academic work defined by a group of people who say it should be this narrow, and that's the work that you do. I mean, you just, you have to do what you love. That's the beauty of being an academic, at least for me, is that, that type of freedom. I tell them I'm not smart enough to see the line in between. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. like, I, I, I reject that. Yeah. I agree with both of them. <laughs> I, mean, it, it, I mean, that's what attracted me to the research that I do. Um, kind of growing, around, growing up and being around people that said young folks just don't matter in the political process. Uh, looking at how new technologies are developed and you know, how voice has been kind of suppressed over time. And for me, it, I think it comes down to motivation and question. Like, I have motivations behind the work that I do in the academic space and the non-academic space. And I have questions that I want to answer uh, in both of these spaces. And, I, and I, for me, that, that seems very clear that as long as I have that, you know, the work that I do, I'm in the academic space, I have a question, I have a motivation, and I can try to come to some type of answer. But the work that I do outside, I, I have a question or a motivation. I kind of know what groups I need to go and when, in, uh, affiliate with and be a part of. And I know that's like that's a space for, for satisfying some kind of goal internally for me. And those those two ideas are consistent throughout. All right, uh, thank you to our panel. This was really great. And thank you to all of you for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.